Hello and welcome to The Money Compass. In each of our Money Journey episodes, Julie brings to you a special guest to share their treasured memories along with the highs and lows of their very own unique and emotional money journey. So Emma, it's your turn in the hot seat for the third of our Money Journey podcast interviews. How does it feel over there? It's all good. Okay. It's different to be sat in this seat, but I'm sure I'll manage. Well, I'm now going to be the quiz master for you. So let me start you off, Emma, with um, the first question of the day. What is your earliest money memory? I'm actually going to go with two here. Both of them seem to be me on a bit of a money making scheme with my sister as a child. So the first one, where we lived, we had a, a big gravel driveway and every time it rained, it used to flood. And me and my sister were on money making schemes where we used to make paper boats and anybody that came round, so my nanny, nanny and granddad or aunties and uncles, they'd come round on a Saturday and we used to sell them the paper boats. We used to charge them 20 pence to race them down the flooded driveway. That's one of the things that I remember from when I was little. And another one is, don't ask me why I did it. There was a wheelbarrow lent up against the fence and I stood on the wheel to try and stand and look over the fence because my dad was talking to someone over the fence. And clever me... Obviously, the wheel turned, I slipped down the fence and slid my hands down and ended up with, I don't know how many splinters. Ouch. Obviously, crying ridiculously as a child. And the only way to get me to sit still to pull all these out with a pair of tweezers was my nanny gave me 5p for every splinter that was pulled out of my hand. So you really were an entrepreneur at a very young age, Emma. I was. <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're two things that I remember from when I was little. One of those is really quite traumatic, to be honest. A little bit. But my hands are okay now. So I was going to say, I've never gonna... seen these scars, so I think you survived. And obviously you were quite... Do you remember how much money you got from your five Ps? I think there were a few pounds there, so that shows how many there were in my hands. And I guess you never stood on that wheelbarrow wheel again. I Nope. And every time I now see a wheelbarrow lit up like that, I'm like, don't stand on it. Don't stand on it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So next thing, Emma, then I'm going to ask you to tell us your money journey in your own words. Oh, it's really interesting. O often we ask people this thing and I always think, oh... That must be really easy. And then I sit down thinking about it and think, what on earth can I talk about? But I've got a few things, so don't worry. So when we were kids, I don't ever remember us being poor particularly or anything like that. But there, there was nothing we ever wanted for. But we always knew kind of there was a boundary. Like I remember going in shops and saying, oh, mum, can we have this? And she'd say, oh, no, no, we haven't got the money to be able to buy that. And me and my sister would always say, well, just just put it on your credit card. Obviously, not realising that your credit card had to be paid back. We just thought it was a piece of plastic that got swiped at the till and, and you got whatever you were buying. Never kind of had the concept that it actually had to be paid back. So it's obviously a very good thing to learn that, that actually it does have to be paid back. You don't just get it kind of for free. I always remember my dad, he had his own business. He was a mechanic, so he had his own garage and he worked really hard weekends, evenings. He'd always be working. Mum worked in the nursery where we went to and at the same school we went to as well. So mum was always there to kind of look after us. But dad always worked really hard and he was the one kind of bringing in most of the money probably to, to give us all the things that we had. And we did have nice holidays. I remember going to Spain and Florida and all sorts of different places when we were little. So we never went without. But like I say, there was always a, oh no, we, no, we can't have that now. We'll We'll have to come back for that another day because... We can't afford it right now. So I'm guessing they had their own budget and their own kind of kind of plan in their head of what they could afford to spend and would always like to try and give us nice things. But there, there was a limit as well. I also remember getting pocket money from my nanny. She was always known as Nanny Bob and <laughs> Nanny Bob always gave us pocket money. So I always remember it being £2.50, but I'm sure it wasn't always that much. But I do remember going around when my sister wasn't there and she'd slip you a £5 note or a £10 note and say, shh. Don't tell your sister, you're my favourite. I'm sure she always did the same to my sister as well, but I'm always going to go with I was favourite. She used to tell me that. This could be a telling moment when your your sister listens to this and you find out that you got it and she didn't. <laughs> yeah, I could be in trouble here, so <laughs> please don't hurt me. So I remember the first big thing that I saved up for was when I was 15, 16. So there was a school trip. Well, I say school trip. It was arranged through school um, with World Challenge and it was to go to Borneo for a month. And it was just over £3,000. And we were told when we kind of signed up to do it, your parents aren't paying for this trip. You oh. need to save up for this. You need to kind of, they call it fundraise, but it, 
it wasn't fundraising. It was because obviously we were spending some of that money once we got out there to help in a school and do different things. So some of the money was obviously to get us there. And some of it was to obviously do the work once we got there. So £3,000 and I thought, how on earth am I going to save up that much money? So one of the things was I, I got a Saturday job, uh, which was working on Norwich Market on the chip stall. I think I was actually quite well paid. I can't remember exactly, but I think it was like eight or nine pounds an hour I got paid. Oh, wow. That's very good. But it was only three or four hours a week. Yeah. So it wasn't a huge amount of money that I was earning as such. But £27 a week, something like that, was was good to obviously help me save towards this trip. But I always used to do it that, say I got paid £27, I would save £20 to go to towards the saving up for Borneo. And the other seven pounds I would keep as money that I could spend. So the, the odd amount is the bit that I always kept for me and the round amount I always put towards saving up. And I did loads of different things to obviously save up for that. Um, I used to go to ballet classes, so I used to make cakes. You all know I like a bit of cake. <laughs> um, I used to make cakes and then uh, my class was at like 8.30 in the evening, but I used to literally go straight from school, sit there and then obviously tempt all of the small children's that went into their class and made their parents buy cakes from me. So <laughs> I did that. Obviously, my dad had his own garage, so I used to wash cars. We did backpacking events in supermarkets, all sorts of different things to be able to save up money for it. And I I always felt a little bit miffed that there were some people that went on that trip that did nothing. Yeah. And their parents did just pay for it. But I think that sense of achievement that you actually paid for that yourself. I mean, I think that as a mindset thing I mean that's just a wonderful achievement and I know you know having worked with you for several years now this is one of the trips that you bring up on a regular basis and something you talk about so yeah so memorable obviously had an amazing time and the fact that you raised it yourself that adds I think it adds that extra special bit towards it definitely and I remember while I was out there messaging my mum because I turned 17 literally like the week before I went and I messaged her and said mum can you book me a driving lesson for when I get back? Like I was so excited about learning to drive and then obviously earning money to be able to pay for that as well. So I remember paying for all of my driving lessons, whereas again, some people when I went to school with their parents paid for them because they, they didn't have the money. So I had my Saturday job that I gave up when I went to Borneo and I came back and I wanted another job. So I went with my mum, funnily enough, into a chip shop one night, one we always went to. And, uh, we were stood at the counter and mum said, oh, Smith, I've got a job. She said to the man behind the counter, do you, do you happen to have any good jobs? She used to work on the, on the market, on the chip stall. Do you think you could kind of give her a job? So he came over and started talking and I just kind of stood there very quietly in, in the corner and didn't say a word. And I remember exactly what he said. And he went, well, does she actually speak? <laughs> and I was just so kind of timid that I wouldn't say boot or a ghost or anything. Like I just did it as I was told all the time. So I was, went to sixth form and I always wanted to be a vet. So I was doing chemistry, biology, maths and further maths. Oh, ouch. That's a bit of a, a hard set there. Yeah. So I did my first year and got my AS level results. They weren't, they weren't awful, but they weren't as good as I was expecting. And to be a vet, most universities want you to have straight A's or A stars first time you can't even take a reset to be able to get in so after my first year of A-levels I was thinking hmm, I don't think I'm cut out for this and I wasn't enjoying what I was doing anymore so I went into work one day and said can I have a full-time job instead of just doing kind of Saturdays and the odd evening after work can I have a full-time job and they said well have you spoke to your parents about this bearing in mind I was only 17 at the time shouldn't you still be doing your, your A-levels and I was like I hate it I don't want to do it so they agreed that they would give me full-time work and all I then had to do was go to sixth form and tell them and I was terrified. And my mum actually came in with me because um, I kind of mentioned it and they said, oh, we need to speak to your parents to say that you're happy to do this. And I remember sitting there and the head of year said to my mum that she was a bad parent for letting me drop out of sixth form because going to university was everything and what was I going to do? Oh, wow. You're going to work in a chip shop. So uh, I obviously took that and ran with it and thought, well, I, I'm never going to want to look back and think they always thought that I should just work in a chip shop. What, what, would, what good would she be? So I carried on working in the chip shop. I was there for another kind of two or three years. The owner sold it, sold it to someone else. And the people that took over didn't speak a word of English. 
So I basically did all the ordering, kind of was the face of the business for, for the time that I was there and basically ran everything for them, all the staff hiring, and firing. And I, t- I took over doing everything and I worked hard. I worked a lot of hours, but I did get paid quite well. But it got to the point where I thought, I, this is basically my business. I'm running it as if it's my own business, but I'm not really getting that much benefit from it. And I said to them, look, I'm thinking about leaving. I do an awful lot of work. And they actually turned around and said to me, how much do you want to be paid? And I was stood there like, um, I don't know. And I think I said £15 an hour. And they didn't even blink. They said, yes, OK. Oh, wow. And I was thinking, damn it, should have said more. <laughs> so I carried on for, I think it was possibly only another month or so. And yeah. I thought, I'm working like 40 odd hours a week. I don't really enjoy what I'm doing anymore. Yes, I'm being paid quite well for it, but I don't want to do this forever. I don't want a job. I want a career. I want something more than that. So when I was working there, we used to get paid in cash every Friday. And I used to take that cash and walk straight down to my building society and pay it in straight away. And again, I always used to do the same, pay a round amount into my savings account and keep the rest for me to spend. Obviously, my expenses had gone up a bit more by then because I had my own car and insurance and mobile phone, all those sorts of things to be paying for. So funnily enough, my next job ended up being the Norwich and Peterborough where I used to go pay my money in. That was where I ended up working and it was the start of my journey into kind of financial services. And I absolutely loved that job. And to be honest, if I'd have had the option to, I'd have probably still been there now because to me it wasn't, it was, I loved it and I could progress and work up the ladder. Yeah. And within two years, I'd actually progressed to be manager, which for me was such a really, like a massive achievement. I was one of the youngest managers that was working there. And I remember we were all sent an email as managers to go to a meeting and it was in Peterborough where head office was, but it wasn't at head office. And I thought, it's a bit odd, isn't it? So we all went to this meeting and I remember leaving that meeting in tears and I phoned my mum in the car and I said, mum, what on earth am I going to do? We've all just been made redundant. Oh, wow. And so many miles from home as well. What? Yeah. And then had to drive back in the car on my own. And I think what possibly made it slightly worse is that the mortgage was accepted on our house that day. <laughs> and I was thinking, crap, I've just lost my job. Yeah. I've got a few months left. What am I going to do? So... I'd been very, very fortunate in the first place that my mum and dad had supported us to put together a deposit to be able to buy our first home. So we'd rented for quite a few years and I never liked renting. It was always, why am I lining a landlord's pocket with money when actually a mortgage would probably be much cheaper than we're paying for rent and had some awful experiences with landlords, had to go to small claims courts over things and all sorts of things. And I just thought I'd love to own my own home. So having the best news, yes, your mortgage has been accepted. Yes, the offer's gone through on the house. And then you've been made redundant. I was thinking, uh oh, this seems like a really bad start. So obviously I could have waited and, and got some redundancy pay, but there wasn't a huge amount of money that I was going to get from it. And I'd thought I'd rather have the financial security yeah. of just going to get another job straight away. So I started searching around and um went for some interviews and I think I think I might have only gone for one interview even it was at a place called Money Facts and we got the keys to our house moved in and on the day that we had the keys to our house and moved in I got the call to say I'd been off the job so it was like two memories from that house the first day kind of when we got it I'd lost a job and the day we moved in I got a new job which was fantastic but I think one of the best pieces of advice my mum and dad received before they gave me the money for that house was don't give Emma that money to buy that house. Loan it to her. Make sure it's all signed and legal because if Emma and her boyfriend split up, you're not going to get all of that money back. You're only ever going to get half of that back. And at the time I felt, oh, my mum and dad's financial advisor, that's a bit mean. Why can't they just give it to me? It makes it a bit harder and a bit more long-winded and blah, blah, blah. But it was the best piece of advice that they ever received because after about a year of living there, we did split up and decided that the house was going to be sold. So it was the best piece of advice, definitely. 
I think part of the reason the relationship broke down is that I was a very, if you can't afford it, don't buy it kind of person. Whereas he was like, I will put it on the credit card, we'll pay for it later. Or, oh, that can go on finance, it's not percent. But when you've got a sofa on finance, a car on finance and this on finance, yeah. you suddenly realise your monthly outgoings are huge, but actually you're not really getting anything from it because actually you've already got the thing. And it just seems a, a very expensive way of living to have everything. I understand the odd thing, yeah. but it just didn't quite sit right. And I went along with it. It's your first relationship, your first home together. and you don't think much of it at the time, but lesson learned, won't be doing that again. <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah, I think that's where I am today. Obviously, the house has been sold, made some money from it, not a huge amount. And the journey is now saving up again to be able to do it on my own. And it's something that I really want to do on my own now. So obviously, last time mum and dad supported me and I, I know they would again, but it's something that I want to do on my own, almost kind of a self-satisfaction thing of no I can do this I don't need to rely on anyone else I'll do it on my own so that's where we are I think you might have missed a tiny bit of your journey Emma you you started Money Facts but you've you've not left there yet well <laughs> and quite an important stage I it is said. I guess I guess that <laughs> that really mean financial advisor <laughs> that gave my mum and dad that really mean financial advice was around their house one day and my mum said to him I could imagine Emma doing this. He was like, who's Emma? <laughs> Our daughter. Now, there's two sides to this story. Obviously, it's your hu husband, Ralph, I'm talking about. He uh, he tells a story that he uh, asked my mum and dad if he they had a young daughter and whether he could buy her. <laughs> um, but obviously, that's not the story. It was a case of they said, Emma, I could imagine Emma doing that. And they said to get in touch. So that was what I did. I sent an email. And uh, there you go. The rest is history that I joined face to face in 2018 I'm now fully qualified financial advisor and I love what I do and I have got the career and not just the job so what I'd always wanted I, I'm now kind of on the journey to have everything that I ever dreamed of and if you've already listened to my podcast earlier on my money journey you'll realize that Emma is one of the big parts of my succession plan for the future there we go so, so they all tie in together somewhere along the lines this is it my trusted team member Definitely. No, that is lovely, Emma. Thank you so much for sharing your money journey with us. As you know, it's the Money Compass podcast. And as you know, travel is very, very important, certainly in my world. So Emma, what is your favourite holiday destination? Well, you've all heard already that Borneo is obviously an amazing holiday, but I'm going to cheat and uh, not tell you my favourite holiday destination because I've been everywhere I've been, I've always loved. But the one place that I really, really want to go to is Croatia. And uh, Julie will know that I booked to go to Croatia and it took me so much kind of kind of get up and go to do it because I was like, oh, I don't know if I can go on holiday on my own. I don't think I want to go on my own. I'm not going to do that. So I finally got around to booking it um, for 2020. I booked it in, I think, the end of 2018 for 2020. And then obviously it got cancelled and then it got moved and then it got cancelled and then it got moved and then it got cancelled. So I, I still haven't got there yet, but that's definitely my bucket list. I really want to go to Croatia. I think that should be your 2022 goal. Definitely. To get you to Croatia. We'll have to have a look and see if they've got the dates out for 2022 for you. I shall have a search. That's it. That's your next task. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Emma, for sharing your money journey. And I hope everyone has found it as interesting as I have even working with Emma for the last three or three or so years, it's still always interesting to hear the bits that we don't know. So learn something new. Thank you very much. And if you're interested in sharing your money journey with us, then please do get in touch and we'd love to hear your stories. Thank you. Bye. And with that, we've completed today's episode. We hope you have enjoyed following along with us today and taking another step closer to a financially secure future. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, you can head over to themoneycompass.co.uk where you can find out more information, hints and tips from today's episode. If you'd like to get more involved, share your own experiences and learn from a friendly community on a similar journey to you, why not join us in our Facebook group? The Money Compass, where we will support you in navigating your way to financial success. Thank you for listening and see you next time.